you've told me and I've heard you say it so many times that you're not in this business to make friends. And I feel like you made one friend and now you're fighting the guy in like the biggest fight of, of your career. You know, how has, how has this happened and how are you feeling about fighting this former friend of yours in a few days from now? Yeah, I feel great about fighting him. You know, he's been running his mouth reckless, saying a lot of things to the media, but, you know, you can only say so much, you know. There's only, you know, so much talking you can do, but who, there's only going to be one man walking, and that's going to be me on Saturday night. So it's going to be beautiful. I can't wait. You know, he's just been running his mouth, and he's not going to be able to run his mouth anymore after Saturday night. How does the feeling compare now to a few days out from a big title fight, Madison Square Garden rematch against Kamara Usman? Like, what are the similarities? What are the differences between those two? Yeah, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of similarities, but, you know, I don't feel any pressure going into this fight. I feel like, you know, I've beaten this guy. This, this fight has played out so many times behind closed doors, so I know how this fight's going to go. He knows deep down inside how this fight's going to go. He's just trying to sell wolf tickets to the fans right now. He doesn't really believe in himself. He doesn't believe that he can beat me inside that octagon, so... You know, there's no pressure on me. I know what I'm going to go do Saturday night, and that's going to end Jorge Masvidal for good. And you believe that he doesn't, he doesn't think he can beat you based on what happened behind those closed doors? Oh, yeah. Deep down inside, Brett, he, as much as he tries to mask it and, and fake to the media and, and lie to the media like he always does with all these fake narratives that he said, he knows deep down inside. We've trained, you know, probably, I, I can't even... I can't even count how many rounds, probably a thousand sparring rounds. Like, he's never won one second of one of those rounds against me, so... He knows deep down inside. He can keep, you know, trying to act like this macho man from Miami who's this thug gangster. But, you know, it just it's so fitting because we're in the desert. You know, he's going to get buried in the desert like these fake wannabe gangsters. Well, he's got, he's got, me, he's got me fooled, at least, because he seems confident to me. Like, this guy seems like he's coming into this fight believing he can win. Like, what do you see in him? Not, you know, in addition to knowing how your former training went, like, what do you see in him that, uh, does he, he, you think he knows or do you think he's kind of convinced himself that he can win this fight? No, he, he knows. He's just convincing himself like, hey, man, I, I still got to go out there and fight this guy and get my paycheck, whether it be a losing paycheck or not. He's going to get paid a lot of money. Yeah, big deal. You know, but he knows deep down inside that he, what's going to happen on Saturday night. But he's going to try and hype himself up to get himself excited. But I promise you, he knows deep down inside. He could, he could be on the surface whatever he wants, but he really knows what's up. When do you think you truly knew that someday I'm going to fight Jorge Masvidal in the octagon. When do you think was that first moment you knew? Yeah. When I came home from the Damian Maya fight, I saw that he was, he was bitter. He was jealous. And the way he treated me, like, he wasn't being like a friend, like, oh, I'm so happy for you. Congratulations, Colby. You just took a big step in your career. He was like a little standoff. Just like, yo, good job, bro. Like, but wasn't like, like really happy for my success. And it's like the old saying goes, Brett, everybody wants to see you're doing well, but as soon as they're doing better than you, then it's a problem. So it was a problem when I started doing better than him. I beat a guy in Damian Maya who he had just lost to, and he realized we were right in line to fight each other. And, you know, he even told, told me after I got back, he's like, hey, man, you know, like, if we got to fight, you know, I'll just let you know. I'd fight my mother for money. So it, it's just so ironic. He doesn't talk to his mother. So it's just funny that he says it like that. Huh. Well, what was that like to, to feel like? Because you guys were close. And to feel like he wasn't truly happy for your level of success and – you said that was the moment that you kind of felt like, well, eventually we're going we're gonna to face off. Like, do you remember what that felt like? Yeah, it, it hurt, Brett. You know, I, I gave a lot to him, man. I put my career on the back burner at first. I was just his training partner. It wasn't about my career. I didn't even think about fights. All I thought about is preparing George for his next fight and his strike force fight and getting him ready for these high-level fights in the UFC. I didn't care about myself. I just wanted to be a good training partner. I just want to show up anytime he needed good wrestling and a good guy that was going to push him in the pace, I would show up every single day for him. So as soon as like, I felt like he backstabbed me then, it, he, he, it was a full turn after I won the interim title versus RDA. But after I felt that and I started to feel it you know, starting to happen, it just it sucked, man. It, it, it just it hurts, man. We were so close and like to come to this. Is just, you can't really put into words how it feels, Brett. Hmm. What you were describing is that you were, you were trying to help him even more so than your own career. Was that unique to George, or was is that kind of how you felt for, for everyone in the camp, or was it something about your relationship with Jorge? No, it was just my relationship with George. You know, he, as soon as I went in and started training at this gym, you know, he, he took me in like a brother, and I embraced him like a brother. You know, he was definitely masking and, and putting up a front. That's not how he really is. You know, not, that's not the person he is, but he's trying to – to get my friendship because he knew I could bring something to the table that he's never had before. Someone that could push him to the limit, that could teach him how to fight five rounds, someone that could give him wrestling knowledge every single day in training camp. And 
you know, I sacrificed everything for him, and I would do it for anybody. You know, I do it for all my close friends, you know, and I have a lot of them that I do it for these days. I'm not a selfish person. I'm a selfless person. So, you know, it was just him. I, I wouldn't do that for anybody else in that gym. And why do you think that that really was? Like, why do you think you guys clicked? I mean, you, you train with a lot of different people, but then you guys were, were roommates, that really, really close friends. You could see that in your interactions. You could see that, in, like, when you cornered him, he cornered you. Like, what made you guys click so much? You know, I, I really think that opposites attract, and we're so complete opposite ends of the spectrum. I'm a college-educated, college-degree kid. He's a dropout in middle school, didn't even graduate middle school, little street thug, you know, wannabe. So, you know, I just feel like, you know, we kind of, we met in the middle, and we found a way to make it work, and it, it just, you know, it's like the saying goes, you know, opposites attract, and I just feel like we were just drawn to each other naturally, you know, obviously, you know, he wanted wrestling for me, and then he, he started to offer, you know, a little striking knowledge here and there to me, and it was just a good fit for us at the time. Mm. It's not surprising when two guys have trained with one another and then they, they have a falling out that their memories of the training are a little bit different, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, you said that you never lost a second to uh, during those rounds. He, in an interview with ESPN, I don't know if you saw it, uh, speaking to Mark Ramondi, he said that he, he, was, he even said, if you sit down with Colby, you ask him, did he ever quit? Did he quit when you and I, when he, when, when the two of you were on the mat? Did he ever make you quit, Colby? Brad, do you, do you believe that he made me quit? I've never quit at one thing in my entire life. So, for him to say that, dude, the guy's been making up fake narratives and fake news the whole week. You know, none of these journalists do their job. They talk about, oh, I lived on his couch. They were saying, oh, Colby lived on his couch. No, bro, I didn't live on his couch. I lived on her couch, and I'm talking about his ex-wife, the mother of his children, Maritza. Maritza Collada, Maritza Masvidal, they're still legally married. I just want to ask, I want you to sit him down and just ask him this serious question because he's not going to answer. He's going to be a child all week at the press conference and not let me get out words and spit it. Just ask him, why do you try and delete Maritza from history? Why are you deleting her and, washing, or, and wiping her away from the internet? She did so much for us coming up, Brad, like you have no idea. This wasn't his couch. He was a broke fighter. He was a loser. He didn't have no sponsors. He didn't have, you know, pe big money fights at that time. He was an up-and-coming fighter. I was a broke college kid, so I had no money, of, of course, too. I'm just trying to work my way in the sport. So she gave us this roof over our head. She put food on our table. She cleaned the house for us all the time. And now he just tried. And, and he gave her two kids. And, and now he's a deadbeat dad. He doesn't want to own up to being a dad. Doesn't want to own up to being, you know, his, that, that being her, his ex-wife. He tried to delete her from the internet and that narrative is false. I never lived on his couch. I lived on her couch. Why do you think, it, it seems like when, when he gets asked about the origins of this, of this rivalry, it's money. It's always money, you know? You, you, you stiffed his coach. You didn't pay him rent, you know, when you were living with him. You were eating his food never paid for anything, you know? Why do you think Jorge continues to go back to money? Why is this at the, the core of, of his beef with you? Because, you know, money is the root of all evil, and to him, that's all that matters. That's why he threw this friendship away, for money, because he realized that we're, we could be aligned to fight each other, and it'd be the biggest payday. They wanted to bury him three fights down. Now he's the main event on a pay-per-view against me. Why is that? Because ex-friends turn rivals. So all these fake narratives he's saying with, oh, I didn't pay my coaches, Dude, why has Dan Lambert not said one thing that he didn't pay his coaches? Because Dan knows. We have a rule at a, we did have a rule at that gym, American Top Team. You pay 5% to the gym every fight. You don't pay the coaches. Nothing else gets paid. That's all that, that gets paid is 5%. I always paid my 5% to Dan. I always paid Paulino on the side. They started misreporting. They said for one fight that I made a certain X amount, which is $380,000. I'll just tell you the exact number, which I shouldn't go into that. I didn't make that amount. You can go ask Dan Lambert. I made 200000 for that fight. That's, that's the truth. That's news. But all the clickbait merchants out there, all these virgins in their mom's basements that are writing their little blogs are saying that I made a certain amount. So he took their word for it. This, this striking coach took their word for it. So I just, it's just so funny because he takes these people's words. He doesn't want to take my word. I'm telling him what I made. Yo, this is what I made. I can tell you that's what cleared in my bank account. That's why Dan Lambert hasn't said one thing that I stiffed anybody, and it was never over money. George has nothing else. He's grasping at straws. He has nothing else to say. He can't say I'm a bad fighter. He can't say I'm a bad person. He can't go to anything that I've done in life, like broken the law. I'm not a felon like him. I'm not a thief. If you want to talk about money, let's talk about him. He's got two theft charges, grand theft. He stole a car. The guy's a criminal. He's a thief. He's went to jail for stealing. So if you want to talk about money and screwing someone, he needs to look in the mirror. That's exactly who he is. Seems like if that, if, if, if that was a, a, a 
debate over how much you were paid, couldn't you just show bank statements? I mean, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be easy to kind of solve that between, the, between exactly. the, the group of you? Yeah. And you did that? I, I was willing to show them, but they didn't want to. They were already set in their ways like, yo, they're competition now. Now they're at the top of the division. They're going to have to fight each other. So he was already picking sides. He drew his lawn in the sand. Yeah, he was with – this striking coach was with George his whole entire career. So, of course, he's going to naturally pick his side when push comes to shove. I didn't care, you know. Like, my growth since leaving that guy, I'm, I'm so happy that that happened. You know, I found, I found out his true colors that night, that it was just over money. He wanted – to say that he get, deserved a certain amount of money from this X amount of money. I didn't make that. I made half of that. So, you know, I'm glad this happened, Brad, because if it never would have happened, I never would have found, found Cesar Carnero, Daniel Valverde, these amazing coaches. Mm -hmm. Look at the growth in my striking. It's went to another level since I've left this coach. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that this happened because if it didn't happen, I wouldn't have found the best thing that's ever happened to me, and that's Cesar Carnero and Daniel Valverde. Yeah, and setting aside Jorge for a second, because I do think that there's there's kind of two pieces to what's going on Saturday, right? It's you and Jorge, and then it's you and American Top Team. And it kind of, the rift with the team kind of started at that Damian Maya fight, right? When you said what you yeah. said about Brazil. Yep. But what you said about Brazil, like the seeds of that were kind of planted in Singapore, right? I mean, Lambert kind of, he, he spoke to us a little bit about Singapore, you want to fight, you flew over there, and then something happened in the locker room, a discussion was had in the locker room. Can you kind of tell us about what happened in Singapore and how that fueled what happened in Brazil? So in Singapore, you know, I, I knew I was, I, was, I was ready to fight the best in the world. I knew I was the best in the world. I wanted higher level competition. Nobody wanted to fight me in the UFC. They knew I was a bad matchup. They knew how talented I would, was and, and what my potential was. So no one wanted to accept fights. So I knew I had to take things into my hand, own hands. I had to forget what people thought about me. This wasn't about making friends. It's about making money. This wasn't about you know, appealing to certain people. I'm just gonna rub everybody however I want because if they have something to say about it, come see me in the cage. Like words are one thing. I, it's just so funny, these fickle fans, because they wanna talk about, I'm so mean, all oh, words, this and that. But then you're out there, you wanna see bloodlust. You wanna see people going out on stretches. You wanna see people getting hurt. So it just, it doesn't make sense that you wanna think like that. But going back to Singapore, you know, I leave, I'm like, I know I need to do something. I need, now I just beat the sixth or seventh ranked fighter in the world, Dung Hum Kim, great fighter, you know, from Korea. Now I need to take a turn. I want to get to title contention. So what can I do to get there? I want, I need a top three fight, you know, a Damian Maya, a Tyrone Woodley, or I don't even know who else was there at the time. And so I need to do something drastic. I needed to just be myself, open up and, and turn it up to 110. And that's what I did. You know, I, I gave it to the fans in Brazil and they didn't like it. You know, I called them filthy animals. I said, this place is a dump. Just being honest, you know, there's, there's no disrespect. It's just, they're telling me when I'm walking to the octagon, you buy more, you will die. Oh, it's okay for you to tell me I'm dying, but I call you filthy animals, and that's not okay? Like, where's, where's the line? Like, well, how is this okay, but that's not okay? So I did that, and, and before that fight, that's the thing. I never knew, going into that fight with Damian Maia after the Dunham Kid fight, I never knew that my job was on the line. They said, hey, we're not re-signing Kobe. Mm -hmm. We don't like Kobe. Sean Shelby told Dan Lambert that behind... Behind, after the, the Dung Hum Kim fight in Singapore, Dan Lam Sean Shelby went to Dan Lambert and he said, hey, we're not re-signing Colby. We don't, we don't like his style. He doesn't, he's not, he doesn't make us money. There's nothing he can do for us. So he never told me this going into the Brazil fight with mm -hmm. Damian Maia. But I knew, I knew I needed to make something drastic. I, I knew, like I had this gut feeling, like God told me, like, yo, you need to freaking do something if you want to take your career in your own hands. So I went out there and did it. I shot the best promo that's ever been shot on Fox Sports. You know, the ratings went through the roof, and the rest is history. They put me in a title fight after that. Did you know when you were doing that, did you know that the, there were the level of, I guess, um, consequences, I guess, that you were going to face in the gym of how some of your peers and how some of your teammates were going to feel about it? Were you expecting the level at which it came? No. Nah, <laughs> I was so surprised. I mean, guys that I was – super good friends with that were from Brazil, you know, just turning their back on me, talking in the media right away, you know, saying, throwing me under the bus when I, I was here to help these guys in training every single day. And, and I'd, I'd give them the shirt off my back for them, you know, and then to hear them go out in the media and just say, oh, Kobe's a piece of person. I can't believe you said this about Brazil, blah, blah, blah. And like everybody team up against me. I remember walking back in the gym that week, just the energy and like everybody looking at me, like they were so pissed off. They, they had serious resentment toward me. It was a tough, it was a tough pill to swallow, Brett. Mm. One thing that I'd ask you is that uh, it makes it makes all the sense in the world that you're, you're going to open up and you're going to talk about things that surround these fights. And Jorge just brought this up as well, though. That why did you start going after people that you were never going to fight? Like why did you, why did you say what you said about Dustin Poirier? Why did you say what you said about Yuana Young Jacek? Like why why start targeting people in in the in the camp 
it just seems like that would make your life more difficult. What would happen with that? See, Brett, that's what happened with that. No journalist out there can go look at the history of timeline of events mm -hmm. of who started running their mouth first. Mm -hmm. I never said nothing to Joanne. I never said nothing to Dustin. They started getting jealous of my success and that I was rising up. And they're such egomaniacs. They didn't like that someone was, you know, next to them in the gym that was on that same level in the UFC. So they started trashing me in the media. Oh, Kobe and his antics. Oh, he's a piece of shit person. Dirt bad, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. You want to say things about me. Don't think I'm not going to say the truth right back to you. Mm. So, you know, of course I'm going to come at the booby woman, Joanna. You know, you're talking about me before I'm getting ready for a title fight. I've never said one thing about you. I don't care about you. You used to send me DMs, you know, like after training, like wanting to flirt with me and, and go out on dates. Just because I didn't give you attention, Joanna, don't get mad at me and talk And Dustin saying it's on site when I never even talked about it. Oh, it's on site, I'm gonna beat Kobe's ass. And even before he said it was on site, he said, oh, I'm not training with Kobe, F Kobe, I'm Robbie, I'm team Robbie Lawler when I was getting ready for the Robbie fight and I was still at this gym. I'm like, Dustin, dude, like, I trained you all the time, bro. I wrestled you every day. Like, you never helped me with strike. You never did nothing. I always came in to help you with wrestling and jujitsu, but now I'm a piece of in your team, Robbie Lawler. Like, dude, of course I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna defend myself. I'm not gonna let these people just talk in the media and not be held accountable for their words, Brett. So, you know, of course I'm gonna naturally respond to that. Going back a little bit to the Jorge thing. So when you, UFC 241 in 2019 in August uh, in California, apparently there was some incident between you. Dana White even had to, to, to become involved in this. You know what I'm referring to? What, what, what happened there? Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, George was in like in the fifth row, he was five row back. So I'm the champion at the time, so I'm first row. And uh, I'm, I'm there to support my boy DC, the Natty Go. You know, Daniel Cormier is the legend, you know, the Natty Go. I call him the Natty Go for a reason. So I'm there to support him in his fight versus Stipe Miocic. And, and I just hear rumbling like behind me and like people were like shuffling. I'm like, what the, what's going on back there? And like, and then I see George, I'm like, yo, what's up, man? What are you doing, dude? Oh, I'm gonna f you up for all the things you say. Let's go outside, let's go do that. I'm like, dude, you really wanna go do this outside, George? I'm gonna dump you on your head. You're not gonna have the UFC to pay your medical bills. So you really wanna do this? And he's just running his mouth from like the fourth or fifth row back. I'm in the front row. And I'm just like, dude, act like, a, act like a professional. And that's the whole thing is like, we're at a UFC event, man. When have I ever laid hands on someone? I could beat up anybody in the crowd, any of the fighters. None of them can touch me. I'm the best fighter in the entire world. But I don't do it because I'm a professional. I handle my business in the cage. That's where I do my business, in the UFC octagon. So that's what the dust up was. Uh, Dana came over to me. He's like, yo, I don't want any stuff. Uh, messing up this event tonight. We need this this fight to go through and we don't need anything to, to ruin it in the crowd. And he goes, tells George the same exact thing. George, chill out, dude. You're not going to fight him, dude. You're not going to fight in the streets. You guys are professional cage fighters. You guys want to fight. You can settle on the octagon. And George is just running this stupid narrative, all oh, this and that. I don't even know what he says because I don't pay attention to what he says anymore because he just makes up so many lies. The guy's a thief. He's a liar. He's a backstabber. You can't believe anything George says. When has anything he's ever said came true or been a fact? Mm -hmm. You think he was doing that to build a future fight with you, or do you think he was doing it because he wanted, um, like, like it was a good attention thing, or, or like he actually did want to fight you in the arena that night? Why do you think he did that at 241? Nah, Brad, he's he's never wanted to fight me. He's he's tried to avoid this fight at all costs. You know, he's delayed and denied this fight until he realized this is the last big fight for him to get money to pay off his alimony and pay off his child support. So, of course, he he didn't want to fight, but. If there's one out of those three answers that you just gave, it would definitely be he wanted to build a fight. You know, he, he wanted to get some publicity. He wanted to get his name in the headlines because he wasn't doing it. His fights weren't winning it. You know, he was off in some reality show, you know, with the Mexican little stars of Ex Exatalon or whatever the show that is called. And he was having, you know, trying to find a resurgence, find a way to draw the headlines, draw the big fights so he could get some publicity. He told us that a few weeks later, you guys saw each other at the gym, had to be separated. There were reports of this. He said that he said, Colby, come to, come to a sushi place that we used to eat at, man to man. He invited you to the sushi place and you did not show up. What happened there? That's the biggest lie I've ever heard, Brett. To be honest, I came in the gym, I looked right at him face to face, I walked right by, and I looked him straight in his face. He didn't say one word to me, Brett. Walked to the mat, started doing my training, and then all of a sudden he's across the gym. He's screaming, Brett, he's like, oh, I'm gonna kill you, Kobe. I can't believe you said this, man. I'm gonna you up, let's do it. And of course he's screaming across the gym when coaches are gonna break him up. If he wanted to do something, Brett, he would've came in my face when I walked right in, he would've done something. But he didn't wanna do something. He just wants to talk the talk, 
Brett, he don't walk the walk. Everything I say is the truth. And I talk the talk and I walk the walk. And that's what I'm going to do Saturday night on pay-per-view in T-Mobile Arena. I'm going to walk my talk. He's not going to be able to walk all this talk that he's saying. So that's not anything what's true. I think at the end he said, hey, let's go on the, uh, the parking lot of Publix, which is like a, a grocery store in South Florida that's right outside the gym at the time. And he said, let's go on the parking lot. Let's go set us outside. I was like, let's do it, man. I was so heated. I was like, I'm going to drop you on your head. I'm going to break your face. But Dan Lambert was like, no, you guys aren't fighting. I'm not letting you fight. That's not how this is going to be, blah, blah, blah. And then he realized it was so, there was so much turmoil that he had to kick us both out. And he kicked us both out. But the thing is, Brett, there was only one guy that went back begging, crying. Please, Dan, take me back. I don't have any other gym to train at. I need you. Please do anything. You can fill in the blanks. It wasn't me. Because I got invited back, Brett. I got invited back to that team. You did? I, yeah. I did, and I decided not to go back because I found a better gym. I found a better team. Daniel Valverde, Cesar Carnero, Charlie Weiss, Jonathan Lopez, people that actually care about me, and I've seen serious growth in my game since then, and it was the best decision and the best thing, uh, events that's ever happened in my life. What happened? Yeah, because Dan Lambert sent you a text, both of you, on the same one, he yeah, said, right? Same, one. same Same group text, said you're same both group. out. Both out. He ended up back there. He yeah. did say that he asked him to come back there. You yeah. got invited back by who? Yeah, I got invited back by Dan and Conan. Really? They, they, yeah, go ask them. <laughs> I got texts. I got, if you want to see the receipts, I can show you them. Mm -hmm. I have them. They invited me back. I didn't want to go back, Brett. It, it wasn't a good situation for me anymore. The last two years training me there, just all drama, terrible energy. I couldn't have any focus in my career. Like, there was no direction, nothing. It just, it was terrible. It, it, you know, it was draining me. And, and I wasn't getting the best out of myself. And, I, it, you know, what was sacrificing was my training and my evolution as a fighter. Now I rid myself of all that drama, all that stuff. Now I have a great camp that actually cares about me. It's not about money. It's not about paychecks. It's about developing us as a fighter, evolving, you know, taking the steps to get better every single day. And I've seen the growth. And, and you're going to see it Saturday night, just like you've seen in Madison Square Garden. I took three rounds off Usman out of fi a five-round championship fight. Every fan in Madison Square Garden said the same exact thing. Just because three little stooges that are sitting cage side that, that judge the fight didn't score the fight for me, they scored a 3-2 for him, that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. The people are the ultimate deciders in this sport, who, who, who wins and who loses. So they decided that I won, and I did win. I won 3-4-5, round 3-4-5. I'm the people's champ. I'm America's champ. Donald Trump's favorite fighter and the king of Miami. All four lucrative titles, and they're going to be put on the line Saturday night in T-Mobile Arena. Just a few more for you, man. I really appreciate it. You, I said earlier that there is two sides of this, right? It's like a rival with Jorge and a rival with at t Is that right? Is this fight you versus Jorge, or is this fight also Colby Covington versus American Top Team? No, this, dude, I have no resentment towards Dan Lambert. He's a, he's a great person. You know, he gave me an opportunity at the beginning of my career, Brad. You know, I, I st I'm still cordial with him, still respect him, still cool with him. I'm not gonna, you're not going to hear me throw him under the bus because there's nothing bad that he ever did towards me. You know, he made a decision that was best for him and his business, and that's that. Mm -hmm. So that's this is not a personal fight versus Jim. This is just personal one on one, mano y mano, me versus George. He said a lot of reckless things. He's been talking out the, his ass, just making up fake narratives because no journalist out there wants to actually do their homework and, and go look at the bottom of what he's saying. They're taking him at face value when he's never been honest or truthful in his whole entire career, but now all of a sudden everything he says is true. So this is just about me settling the score with him. Mm -hmm. So I promise you that that score, score will be set at this Saturday night. Final thing for you, how do each of your careers go after this fight? What path do you go on? What happens to Jorge? Everybody knows what paths are going to be taken after this fight, Brett. I'm going to rise up to superstardom. I'm going to, I'm going to get back my title. You know, and his career is going to be over. This is his last paycheck. This is his last big fight and, and any fight that he can even monetize off of. So I'm going to leave him in a pool of his own blood. He's not going to be the same person after I'm done with him on Saturday night. And, and that's going to be that. I'm going this way. He's going this way. It's been a long time coming, man. Uh, congrats on, on being here at Fight Week and looking forward to Saturday, Colby. Thank you for the time. Thanks, man.